It's the 12th of May, 2015, and this is episode 212. This show is intended for informational and educational purposes only. What cryptocurrency enables is new, empowering, and exciting, but we're not experts. Just obsessed companions walking the road towards a more peer-to-peer future. Hey there, I'm Adam B. Levine, and you're listening to Let's Talk Bitcoin. Today we're down in Texas for the recent conference, courtesy of some awesome recordings from Rob Mitchell over at the Bitcoin game. First, we hear from Austin Fothery with his talk entitled The Self-Compelling Nature of Hypercapitalism. Then, one of my favorite economists, Dr. Robert Murphy, elaborates on the Mises theory of money and how to save the economy in 10 minutes. We've got inspiration and education today. Let's push things forward. Here's Austin now. The end of the income tax. You all can cheer. Implicit social security, a clean environment, global reduction in risk, an end to finance as we know it, an end to indentured employment, and faster technological innovation. We can achieve all of these things in the next 10 years by making one small change to our idea of money. My name is Austin Fothery, and I've had these ideas rattling around in my head for a while, and it's time for me to put them out there for you all to vet them and for you all to help me. And the reason that I'm here and not someone with an actual economics PhD is because even just a few months ago, these ideas were not possible. But with Bitcoin and the blockchain... They're now possible. My idea is called democratic hypercapitalism. It is a movement and a new social contract that changes the way we use and view money. Here's a current transaction today under capitalism. I want a bottle of wine. You're a winemaker. I have a dollar. You have the wine. We exchange. Now I have the wine and you have my dollar. We're here today at the Texas Bitcoin Conference talking about doing this, making the currency better, which is a great idea, and we're making a lot of progress towards that, but I'd like to ask us all to step back a little bit and look at this whole transaction. Can we make this whole transaction more human, more whole? And I want to start by asking the question, if capitalism is so great, why aren't we all capitalists? And I mean that in the sense of why aren't we transacting in capital all the time? Well, in hypercapitalism, we are. This is it. This is the big change. Under hypercapitalism, instead of just giving me a bottle of wine for my dollar, you also give me a share of a form of preferred stock. Now, preferred stock or airline miles for everything or tokens, the name is not important. What's important is that this is an inalienable unit of account that says, I gave you a dollar in the past and gives me a benefit in the future. This is all in the blockchain already, and we're just not paying attention to it yet. So let's talk about why we need to change everything. The way I see it, capitalism is awesome. It's brought us a long way. But we all know that it has some holes in it. One of the first problems I'd like to talk about is the my dollar doesn't buy a dollar's worth of stuff problem. And this is a known problem with capitalism. It's the idea of economic rent. Everywhere we go, we're being charged economic rent. And economic rent is the amount above the cost of production that you pay because you're at a disadvantage. And this is an issue because when you get paid a dollar for your work, You can't go get a dollar's worth of stuff. If you go to buy an iPad that is $400 and it costs Apple $200 to make it, you are being charged some form of economic rent. Now, this is important because we want to value our labor. Labor is what makes everything in our world. This is what a number of people on the left call the inalienable right to the full output of labor. And it's important. The reason this is really a problem is that economic rent is awesome, okay? It is the reason we get up in the morning. The fact that I can make something, I can spend X making something and sell it for X X plus Y is the reason that we get up. It drives our economy and it drives innovation. 
I believe we can have both. And in hypercapitalism, we take the fact that our wage minus the economic rent that we pay is usually less than the value of our labor, and we add in a benefit over time that flips our inequality to a positive so that all of a sudden we're making more than the value of our labor. This maintains the power of the market while restoring the dignity of labor. There's another problem with capitalism. It's the rich get richer problem. You know this problem too. Sometimes it's great when the rich get richer, when they're delivering value, when they're making the world a better place. We want to encourage this. But sometimes those with wealth use it to obtain wealth in an inappropriate manner or just on paper. We've got a lot of on paper going on these days. This is the R greater than G problem. If you've read Piketty's Cap in the 21st century, you're familiar with this. If not, um, all this says is that if the rate of return on capital R is greater than the growth rate in the economy for an extended period of time, that capital concentrates and inequality grows. This is a 99%, 1% problem. So to try to fix this, I try to take the rate of return on capital and split it out into its constituent parts and uh, different types of capital because we can treat different types of capital differently. And the two I want to talk about today are natural capital and artificial capital. Natural capital are the things around us that we use uh, to make other things. Factories, shovels, bulldozers, cars, trucks, humans, computers. These things all have an implicit carrying cost and they are subject to entropy. Naturally, you have to redistribute your wealth to maintain them. Artificial capital are the things in our society that we make up uh, their ideas. Dollars, bitcoins, gold, these things that have value because of ideas, and they are not subject to entropy. And I believe that this is a problem. A lot of the reasons we have boom and bust cycles is because we like to pretend that our money is good while everything around us is decaying and somebody ends up holding the bag. We have to maintain R because if you get rid of R, you get rid of G. The communists tried that um, and it didn't work. So what we want to do is we want to move these sliders and change our, our, uh, uh, our goals. So we want to drastically increase the rate of return on natural capital and drive down the rate of return on artificial capital and keep R but uh, hopefully change this so that inequality doesn't grow nearly as fast or that uh, it raises all boats. And it turns out that this problem was solved over 100 years ago by uh, this guy, Silvio Gassel. Um, He came up with this idea in his book, The Natural Economic Order of Stamped Money. And the way this would work is every month you'd have to go down to the post office, buy a stamp, lick it, and put it on your dollar and, um, to keep it valid legal tender. And um, this is natural decay on your money. This is controlled inflation. It turns out this is a really great idea in theory, but in practice, catching up $83 by licking stamps is a bit of a drag. But with digital currency, it's just math, and it just works, and we can just charge the fee at the time you use your money next. So we've got natural money, and natural money is cool. Natural money has a 0% interest rate, and it has an increased velocity. Because it's a hot potato and everyone is passing it around, um, you either need to spend it, invest it, or loan it out. Um, and, and this just makes money flow faster. It also helps us control inflation. Because it decays, we can take money, we can cr- increase the rate and take money out of the economy when we need to. John Maynard Keynes thought this was a very interesting idea as well, and he said, I believe the future will learn more from the spirit of Gassel than from that of Marx. We all know how the Marx experiment turned out. It's time to start listening uh, to Gassel. Um, And Keynes points out some problems uh, in his book, The General Theory. There's an entire chapter on Gassel. Uh, uh, I think we solved some of those problems. So we have natural money, and that's great. But I want to go a step further and humanize our money. Money is our tool. We can make it what we want. Okay? It's for us. This is a quote from Steve Jobs in one of the uh, mantras of Apple, that man is the creator of change in this world. As such, he should be above systems and structures and not subordinate to them. Okay? Our money and our economics is a system. 
And whether you are of the Chicago school, maybe you're a Keynesian, maybe you're of the Austrian school, it's time for us to stop letting you paint us into a corner. Your system is only as right as we are unwilling to break it. So let's break it. And this is how we humanize our money. These little bits that you pay down at the post office that we're going to digitize, Silvio Gassell had them going to the government for standard social services. We're going to do something different. We're going to have those bits flow back to this preferred stock of the people that own the stock in the account that the money is decaying in. In the example of our wine, I gave the winemaker a dollar. If he holds on to it for a year at a 12% decay rate, I would get 12 cents back. If he had gotten rid of it and given it to someone else, he would have gotten the 12 cents, and I would have gotten 12% of his 12 cents. What happens is we create this sort of recursive phenomenon in the economy that creates a backflow of blood in our economy that increases our optionality and reduces our exposure to volatility. In this system, there is a one-to-one relationship between how much and how well you participate in the economy and your future benefit. Now, to do this, all we need is a way to know every transaction, know who sent how much to whom, when the transaction occurred, and need a system that can reject any transactions that try to not follow the rules and not pay the fee. Does anybody have any ideas? This is the Bitcoin blockchain. It's all already there. Now, that's all I have on the hypercapitalism side. There's a democratic side that helps restore accountability to our government that you'll have to talk to me afterwards about because it doesn't have quite as much to do with Bitcoin. But let's talk for a minute about how this changes everything in our economy. We can tax this backflow and drastically simplify tax collection and get rid of the income tax. Over a 30-year career of working and spending, you will amass a massive amount of this preferred stock, and it will create a cash flow to your account. This is implicit social security. Maybe you only work 10 years and you want to go back to school or start a family. You won't have as much, but you'll have enough of a cash flow to keep food on the table and find your optimal place in our society, the right place so that our division of labor is optimized. When your cash decays, you have to quickly convert it into something else. This something else is most likely valuable, renewable, sustainable capital. This will create a flight to value in our economy and drastically change our idea of what we spend our money on. Investing will be significantly changed. When you can invest in a company, and even if they go bankrupt, you can be made partially or completely whole, This is going to change the risks we take, the innovative things that we can can invest in. It shifts the the risk curve significantly. And corporations are going to love this because they can hire more people. They can try new things. They can be more innovative with less risk. When your banker gives you a loan of $1,000, he's going to get 1,000 shares in your account. Even after you pay back the principal, he will have interest in you, and what happens in your account from then until the day you die. So we get rid of bankers, and we turn them into a form of venture capitalist that can never sell their stock and whose future profits depend on how well you do. How do you think this is going to change your relationship with your banker? When your employer owns a significant amount of your account and has the ability to make back your past salary if you make more in the future than in the past, How do you think that's going to affect your career training or your health care plan? These are just a few of the ways that we can change our economy for the better using hypercapitalism. In the 1200s, the king of England was being a bit of a bully. And um, he was trying to raise taxes from the nobles and get troops from their land. And they wanted to hold him accountable. And they were having, they were at odds. Um, It turns out cooler heads prevailed. And 
They came to agreement. They realized the king was good at fighting wars, raising taxes, and running the state. They were good at running their estates. They created a new social contract called the Magna Carta, and it has changed our idea of statehood for the last millennium. It's time for a new social contract between capitalists and citizens, one that says we will allow you to charge us your economic rent because we understand its power. But over time, you will either use it to create more value or you'll return it to us. We can do this today. And in this system, we can make it so that you never spend another dollar in vain, that every dollar you make is a dollar that you earn out, that you can spend out in the marketplace. I'm launching a Kickstarter today to raise some money to build this on Testnet. Now, it'll just be an experiment, and you won't be able to actually transact anything, but we need to prove that we can do this. And once we do this on testnet, we can do some computer simulations and, and, and make sure that this thing is actually ready to go. So I'd ask for your help in that. Um, and of course, if you want to donate to this, you can always donate to Bitcoin. Um, I have a book called Art and Democratic Hypercapitalism, which you can access via hypercapital.info, where I have some more information about this, and follow us at Hypercapital. Now... Um, that's it. I'm looking forward to visiting with you all, and I would love to answer some questions. Right. Oh, just before my question, you mind pulling up the slide where you say we want to see everybody's transactions so we know who's paying? I just want to take a picture of it. All right. Here's the question. Really? Really. We can do this today. And the interesting thing about this is it's a bootstrapped... Uh, it, no, it I'm can... sorry. I meant that's insane. What's that? I meant that's insane. It's Why? A... There should be privacy in the system. Sure, absolutely. So let's, talk about, let's talk about privacy. So you can do this anonymously on the blockchain, right? You still have a. Re- you don't have to know who sent you the money to send your money back to the address that sent it to you, right? I hope you have your private keys. Um, but but that's the idea. Is is um, privacy is very important, and there's some stuff I have in there about how to maintain privacy, and we can do that. Uh, but sometimes you don't. Uh, Sometimes you don't want privacy. Uh, do you own any stock, anything? Okay, do you own that anonymously? It would be nice to own it anonymously, even if you still want to get the dividend. You don't own it anonymously because you want to get the dividend. You want Apple, if you own Apple stock, you want Apple to know they need to send you your dividend every quarter. So it's a, it's a question. There's some things we want privacy for and some things that are not necessary to have privacy, and the system incorporates that. And what it does is it gives privacy to citizens. It limits privacy for uh, legal entities, and it denies privacy for the government. Um, so that's the way the system's set up. My idea of economics is completely opposite to all of this uh, a couple years ago as well. And it's a little contrarian thinking that led me down this path, and it's, it's an experiment. I want to see what happens if we, uh, if we try to implement it. What's your question? Yes, sir. I am very excited by the potential of what you've brought to us. Tell me uh, how the community would bootstrap itself other than it seems like an ideal world the governments would say, okay, this is what we're going to do next, like maybe China would do it that way. Uh, but how would our community bootstrap itself out of your Kickstarter project? I have one minute. Let me see if I can do this in a minute. Um, the idea, I think in the book, this thing is called the self-compelling nature of hypercapitalism. And the idea that it's self-compelling is because you can go to your employer and say, I want to be paid in this kind of money. They don't have to participate in this system initially to participate in it. But on the back end, we can begin to sort of store up some value in the system to entice them. We can put some money into escrow, and all of a sudden, they can come claim it because they're the ones who paid it. And it decays, so it ends up going back into the economy. But but there's a way to bootstrap it using the blockchain and some basically a a virtual value and publishing the virtual value that people have stored up. Um, So that's the idea is is just sort of uh, our idea is hopefully to give you a bank account that you can get money paid into. And uh, we sync up on the back end. If you pay someone else in the system, it matches you up and and does that. So that's that's the idea, the thought. Any other questions? Yes. They're not forcefully diluted. These are this is not common stock. It's not voting stock. You don't control the person that you own stock in. All you have is the right to the money that decays in their account. It's not dilution because, um, well, today their, um, their money is decaying anyway because of inflation, number one. And so we're just using that to our advantage. Over the long term, there is, a, uh, there is a, uh, one, of the, one of the issues I address is the idea of the corporation. 
and the power and, the, and all the good things that the corporation has brought us, but then all sort of the exhaust of having a, an immortal entity can kind of bring to an economy and the drag that it can make on technolo- technological innovation. And so if you think about this concept, there is a law of diminishing returns. As a company uh, sells more and more, the, the five billionth person that spends some money with Apple, their dollar going to Apple is going to have much less benefit than the first person. That's going to be a problem, and they're going to have to drastically up their game to uh, stay valuable in the market, or they're going to have to seed the market to, uh, to, to younger, more agile companies. We're not, we're not diluting their, their common stock. We're just, it's, it's just kind of a point system. I mean, when you get an airline mile, you don't dilute Continental. Does that answer your question? Why do you think it would be an issue for a winery? And, and that, that's exactly the evolutionary uh, a system we're looking for. When he decides to retire, he moves on. He moves to someone with more modern, more adept business practices. That's exactly kind of, kind of what I'm sort of driving here. Could you elaborate a little bit more on the uh, controversies or criticisms academically or friction points? I, I'm presenting this for the first time today. Um, I, if you are an actual true economist, I would love to talk to you and vet these ideas and, and find where the weaknesses are and those kinds of things. One issue that, that's been talked about uh, by a lot of economists is this idea that money is a store of value. And to me, that, that doesn't make a lot of sense, um, or at least it, it messes with my mind a little bit, because all value is future value. The value that's being delivered right now is gone, right? All we have in this world is the future. Trying to, to do something to store that, if you do that, and when you do that, somebody's always getting over on somebody else. Um, and that's why we have a lot of issues with, with currency, because it's, it's a, by definition, sort of an artificial concept. Um, and so I'm trying to, to fix some of those things. So I think, I think I've talked to some people who are like of the Austrian economics who are like, you're getting rid of savings, and I'm not trying to get rid of savings. I'm trying to drive investment in value, right? When you have to get rid of your money, or put it, put it this way, if you go to the car lot, and you realize that if you're going to spend the money that you spend on this car, if it goes into Kia's account or it goes into Tesla's account, and you try to think about which one you think is going to have longer future, you know, going out is going to produce more value in our economy, you might make a very different choice than you would if you were just a sort of a halfway crony capitalist to say, I'm going to go try to get the most value for my money and let's drive the price down and not do anything, anything innovative. And so that's, that's kind of the idea. So let's... Uh, Good? All right. Thank you, everybody. Today's episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin is brought to you by the Trezor Hardware Wallet. If you've been thinking about getting a Trezor, the time to do it is now. You can use the discount code letstalkbitcoin.com to get your Trezor, normally about 120 bucks for $99, and enjoy the fact that you're also donating about $10 of your purchase price to the show. This discount won't be around forever. Visit buytrezor.com for more information, and remember to use the discount code letstalkbitcoin.com. And today's magic word? That's howdy. H-O-W-D-Y. Howdy. You've got until the 19th of May to visit letstalkbitcoin.com or the Let's Talk Bitcoin iOS app to enter it for your share of the listener rewards. I was supposed to go at one. I'm going a little bit early so you don't get confused. So I'm Robert Murphy. I'm an economist. And as uh, she said, I'm the author of uh, what's called Understanding Bitcoin. My co-author is Silas Barta. Silas, are you, he's, he's here in front. So he's more the, the, the cryptography kind of you know, programming guy, and I'm the economist. And so uh, it's a free PDF. I just want to point you to the website, understandingbitcoin.us. Just uh, a little crowd interaction. Do you guys know why we picked the domain name understandingbitcoin.us as opposed to .com? Any guesses? Because .com was already taken. That's why. Okay, so this is the mnemonic to get you guys to remember the URL. Okay, so I have a very brief time, obviously, here. So let me just explain to you guys why, as an economist, I'm interested in Bitcoin with my background and how I came to be interested in it. And then I want to summarize two economic objections that, you know, as far as my fellow economists, what they say against Bitcoin or what the general public might be worried about Bitcoin, and then, you know, my response. 
And if we have time, I'll have questions or I'll be hanging around a little bit later. So my background is, and on the schedule it mentions Mises, that refers to a very famous economist of what's called the Austrian school. And that's the school of thought that I, I believe in. And one of their key contributions to economic theory is their understanding of the business cycle. Okay, So I think just about everybody recognizes there's a danger with the state controlling or heavily regulating money and banking. right? Just like everybody kind of knows it's a bad idea to let the state run the media or to run the schools or to run car companies, even though you know, those are no longer hypothetical things at this point, uh, they can see how the state being involved with money could be a potentially very dangerous thing. Right? So that's standard. But most people, when you say, well, why is that a problem? They'd say you know, two things. Well, there could be hyperinflation if they create too much of it. And we have historical examples, you know, interwar Germany, more recently in our time, Zimbabwe, where we see what happens if the state just dumps too much money into the system. And they can also reward their crony friends if they have the control of the money. So that's also a concern that the average person has, that, that they're, the little guy's probably not going to benefit from a system in which the state has its hands in the money. But the Austrians say something a lot more subtle. They say the familiar boom-bust cycle that we associate with modern capitalist economies, that's actually not something inherent to the nature of the free market. That's not just, yeah, that's the price we pay for prosperity, that you have wild upswings and then there's busts, but you know, if you want to have that, that growth and dynamism, that's what we have to accept. No, the Austrians say, on the contrary, even that pattern is because of state intervention in money and banking. And the, the idea is the state comes in, floods the credit markets with money, pushes down interest rates, and that gives a false illusion of prosperity that's a boom period, but it's unsustainable. Okay, So that's where I was coming from. You know, I, I went to school, I studied that, I did my dissertation in this area, and I was going around and, and involved with groups like the Mises Institute, which is named after this economist who subscribed to this and developed this theory. And so we're going around telling people that the way you not only protect the value of your money, but also avoid this boom-bust cycle is to take money and banking out of the hands of the state or out of its heavily regulated uh, hands and return it to the, the private sector, that historically money and banking arose from the voluntary private sector. It's not like some king invented money. It came you know, from the market. And so the way to safeguard that stuff is to return it to the private sector. So that's where we were coming from. And in this realm, it tended to be we favored hard money, like gold and silver, okay? And, and that was were commodity monies, and then we were very skeptical of fiat money. Now, I'm sure most of you know that term, but then there's video here just in case people don't know. So fiat money means it's not backed by anything. It's just the monetary item is what it is. It's not a claim on anything else, okay? And it's not useful for anything else except to be to serve as money, whereas gold coins back in the day, you could melt them down and use it for industrial purposes or you could turn them into jewelry, that gold was valued before it became money. All right, the, the monetary function piggybacked on the pre-existing industrial and consumer usage. Okay, so for a long time, many free market economists, people who would probably call themselves libertarians, they had in their minds that commodity money was created by the market and was good and was hard and the virtue of gold and silver was you couldn't just flood the earth and double the supply of gold like that, that there were you know, scarce, you know, physical scarcity constraints on that. And that was a, a virtue of it. So you, you didn't have to worry about a massive hyperinflation. And also it was decentralized, right? No one group owned all the gold mines. And that was considered a, a virtue of it for people who were skeptical of giving too much power in the hands of an elite group. And then in contrast, most free market people were really afraid of fiat money because, again, that historically had been associated with the state. So I'm, partly what I'm doing here now is to not only give you guys my background, but also so you understand, as I'm sure many of you have experienced, one group of people that you would have predicted would love Bitcoin and embrace it with open arms and, and cryptocurrency more generally would be the, the sort of the people that were really into economics and really into free markets and libertarian political philosophy. But actually, there's a, a group of them who are very skeptical of, of Bitcoin, uh, you know, downright hostile. And so I'm just explaining to you, it's partly because here was something that was coming from the market, was clearly not created by the state and was very decentralized. And yet, according to that bifurcation, was it was a fiat money. It wasn't that people were using bitcoins for industrial purposes. And then someone said, oh, you know what, this would be a good medium of exchange. No, that's, it was designed from the get-go to be 
a, a system of payment or a currency and a payment system. Okay, so I'm explaining to you that um, just that that knee jerk hesitation that some people have had. If you if you want to see that more, we write it up in our Understanding Bitcoin guide, and then last year at the 2014 talk I gave at this conference, I went into that with more in more detail. But let me deal with two different objections today uh, that, again, are more generic economic objections. So one is people say Bitcoin is deflationary, and that's a, they think that's a bad thing, right? And we have been conditioned, uh, certainly in the United States, I know we have people here from other countries, I don't know how much of it is in, in Europe and so forth, but certainly here, deflation is the boogeyman. And people are like, oh, we can't have deflation. And that's, you know, Federal Reserve officials explain to people why deflation is a horrible thing. And that's why we need to do these rounds of QE and we're doing everything we can to avoid deflation. And why do people think that? Why is, why is deflation so scary? Um, and, and you can see the connection to Bitcoin because Bitcoin tops off at 21 million units of it. And then that's it. And so if, if more people start embracing it, the demand to hold Bitcoins goes way up and population grows and so on. So you can understand how if the production of cars and houses and food keeps going up while the number of absolute number of Bitcoins is fixed, clearly you would expect that the exchange ratio between those would change. So the price of things quoted in Bitcoins eventually would start going down. Bitcoins would become stronger and stronger in terms of their purchasing power. And so that's what most people mean by deflation. That's what they mean, that the prices are falling quoted in, in that currency. And so since we've been conditioned to think deflation is a horrible thing and our valiant saviors at the Federal Reserve and so on, ECB, the Bank of Japan, are out there doing their best to ward off deflation, why in the world would we voluntarily embrace some currency that's got that aspect built right into it? Okay, so that's the logic. So a uh, couple ways to diffuse that particular concern. One is to say historically... Partly where this fear of deflation comes from is historically it's associated with very bad economies, right? So during the Great Depression of the 30s, there were falling prices, okay? And there's other periods where prices fell when things were bad. But I would argue that the causality was the other way around, that partly what was going on there is people were concerned because the economy was so terrible. And so what do you do when you're afraid? You don't want to invest in companies and things like you rush to liquidity. You rush to hard money. And so that's why often you see in periods of panic, people rush to the money. And so you see prices of other things quoted in money fall. So there, it's not that the falling prices caused the bad economy. It's the other way around. Okay. There's also periods in U.S. history when the dollar was strictly tied to gold, where you see consumer prices were gently falling over time. And it was a period of prosperity, right? So if you think about it, just in general, if the, if the amount of real stuff is growing, faster than the amount of money, other things equal, you would expect the price of those things, quote the money to go down, right? Because the same dollars are chasing more and more real things. The dollar price of stuff goes down. Think of it like that, right? And so in general, falling prices are actually a good thing. You as as an individual having a certain amount of money at your disposal, the cheaper everything else is quoted in that, that means the more stuff you can buy, okay? So it's odd that we've been conditioned to fear that. But now a little bit more technically, really, what, you know, you study economic theory, you see that the real issue with money, it's, it's not that the money per se makes us richer or poor, right? Money is, and if you were here yesterday, you saw uh, George Gilder's talk, and this is partly what he was getting at here, is that money, you know, don't think of it as something that's materially wealth and, and giving us a higher standard of living because of its physical properties, it's helping us communicate with each other. It's an it's a information transmission system, okay? And so when you think of it like that, here's a, a simple thought experiment. If all of a sudden, the, let's say we're using dollars, if the number of dollar bills doubles, clearly we're not all twice as wealthy, right? If you as an individual, if your dollars doubled and everyone else stayed the same, then you would be a lot wealthier, but it's not because humanity would be more capable of producing cars and mansions and yachts and movie theaters, it's just because you would now have the ability to bid away more of those, that fixed stockpile of stuff, and everybody else would be a little bit poor. You know, the people who had dollars who didn't see their stockpile go up, but yours magically did. Okay, and so if you just think through the logic of that, I hope you can see my point that if everybody, if we all went to sleep tonight and then woke up tomorrow and our bank balances were all doubled, quoted in dollar bills, we would not all be 
as rich as we thought. We would go out into the marketplace and find that prices quoted in dollars had gone way up. So initially you'd be you know, surprised, bank error in your favor, your checking account doubled, but then you'd go to the store and find things were more expensive. Okay, And so you'd say, oh, wait a minute, this wasn't the boom that I thought it was. And in fact, if you think it through, we would all actually be worse off. It's not, it wouldn't be a wash. It's not that everything would just magically double. Some things would go up more than double. Some things wouldn't go up as much. Some people would get to market first and spend their new dollars, and they would benefit, and other people would be caught holding the bag, and they would lose out. So you can see it would be a discoordination. Okay, So that's when you realize that, it's not the total quantity, absolute number of dollars that matters. It's how well does it allow us to plan things and to facilitate, facilitate our transactions. That's what the social function of money is. It's a communication or information device. Again, as uh, people going back to Friedrich Hayek pointed out in, in George Gilder's talk yesterday in his paper in the proceedings, if you really want to pursue that further. Okay, so in that regard then, really what economists will tell you is the problem with deflation, if they mean falling prices by that term, the problem with that is when it's unanticipated. Okay, so where it could really bite you is you go out and buy a house, take out a 30-year mortgage with a fixed monthly payment quoted in the money, dollars or euros or whatever, and then all of a sudden there's a change in the purchasing power of money and your salary goes way down, okay? And even if the things in the grocery store also get cheaper, nonetheless, your mortgage doesn't get cut in half, okay? Your fixed payment. So that's the kind of thing, especially historically, where People say deflation was a really big problem, that farmers, for example, who took out mortgages thinking that the price of their goods, you know, their crops were going to be a certain thing, and then prices collapse, they got stuck because they still owed the bank that fixed dollar amount. Okay, so what that really means is it's not inflation or deflation per se that's the issue, it's predictability. And so once we realize that, you see Bitcoin, far from being uh, a liability, the fact that it tapers off and, and caps out and that at any given time we can predict fairly well how many Bitcoins are going to be in existence in the year 2038. You can't do anything like that with fiat government money and even with gold and silver, you're not as sure. I mean, technically, an asteroid could crash on the earth that you know, has all kinds of new tons of, of gold, for example. Okay, so even with something hard like gold, technically... We don't know exactly how many tons of gold there will be in humanity's possession in the year 2200. We really have no idea, whereas we know precisely how many Bitcoins will be in existence in the year 2200, okay? So that's actually a virtue of Bitcoin. Okay, I just got a few minutes left. Let me deal with one other objection. And again, if I've piqued your interest, go to understandingbitcoin.us to read more of these. The other objection that's very... Oh, am I getting a gong? Okay. She said I could have a little bit more time so that I'll start juggling after this point. Um, last thing, the main thing I want to talk about here is mining. Okay, so here it's a little bit of a subtle objection, but obviously you guys come to this conference, so you're a step ahead of the crowd here, so let me walk you through it. The objection runs like this. It says, in the original vision of Bitcoin, like in the white paper and so on, the way its boosters promote it, they say, oh, it's this decentralized system. Nobody is in charge of Bitcoin because it's the community itself decides what makes it onto the ledger or not, okay? And so that's, that's the supposed virtue of it. But they said, look, in practice, you see that there are these mining pools and look at how much power they have. Look at the percentage of the computing power devoted to maintaining the blockchain that is effectively under the control of just a few key people just in practice the way these mining pools have developed. And then some economists have taken it further and said, that's not an accident. That's not a coincidence the very nature of Bitcoin mining is, has what they call economies of scale. And so we should predict as this progresses, if Bitcoin takes off and more and more people embrace it, and that means more and more people are willing to pay money to bring in big processing power to get into the mining and so on, the, the allegation is uh, that since there's economies of scale, we should expect this to continue, that it's just going to merge and merge and merge until there's going to be at best two d- giant cartels controlling all of the mining and who's to say that they're not going to get in cahoots with each other. And obviously that, that defeats the purpose. So instead of us having a bunch of central banks right now, we're going to have one or two central banks running Bitcoin and that these key people are going to control it. And the, and the perversity of it is the individual miners who join those pools might do so unwittingly and not realize that they're serving nefarious purposes, right? Because the way the mining pools work is you tie your computer into it and you do part of the processing without really seeing the big picture. Okay, so that's, that's the allegation. 
And so the way we handle that in our, in our guide is to say, you know, and I hear as an economist, I mean, I understood the economics of it, but I needed to really make sure I understood the way the mining worked and so on. So I talked to Paul Snow and a bunch of other people. So we said, no, actually, um, as an individual miner, the reason you would join a mining pool, it's not to increase the expected payoff, right? It's not that you're going to earn more Bitcoins per week of your computer's processing time. Actually, it's, you'd expect it to go down a little bit because there's overhead in the mining pool. The reason you would join the mining pool is to lower the volatility of your payoff, okay? And so an analogy is if there's a, you, you hear that, oh my gosh, some guy dropped, he had a bag of gold coins and he was walking out in the field and there was a hole in it and we know there's gold coins spread across this huge field, but we don't know exactly where they are. And then you got a thousand people who show up who are going to go look for it and it's finders keepers, right? Just suppose, you know, if you find it, you get to keep it, you don't have to give it back to the guy, Okay, we could just all go out and look for it and we could figure out how much total square area is there, you know, how much of that can you see with your eyes and not miss it. And you could just run some quick probability, how fast do I walk and that sort of thing. And you could figure out per hour of me walking around this field, how many gold coins am I likely to find per hour of my search time? All right, now the problem is if we all go out and do that. We don't know exactly where the coins are. Somebody might get lucky and find 10 of them. Somebody else might be looking for 10 hours and find zero. Okay, and so we could all agree beforehand, hey, you know what, instead of having these huge winners and losers, why don't we just all agree we're all going to search and then we'll split, you know, we'll pool it together at the end, how many gold coins as a group we find and then distribute them in a more even fashion. And somebody might say, well, hang on, though, I'm I'm taller, I walk faster and I have better eyesight. I'm going to find more gold coins per hour than you will. And so if we could, uh, you know, verify that we might say, "Okay, you get out of the pot, you know, we're going to give you twice as many as we give to this person over here. But the point is, why, why would anybody agree to do that? It's because it re- takes the uncertainty or it reduces the uncertainty of it or the volatility. So now we're more confident that if I'm in a group of a thousand people, we're going to go find some of these gold coins and I know I'm going to get some of it. Okay. But clearly it's not that by joining the group, everyone in the group is going to get more gold coins total than they would have if they all looked individually. That, that's not going to happen, right? You're not making your search more efficient by joining people you're making it uh, less risky, okay? And so that's the logic of what happens with the mining pools. That's why you would join them. It's, it's not that your computer now, that you're gonna earn more Bitcoins per hour you devote of your search time or processing time. So once you see that, you realize there aren't inherent economies of scale in, in, the, in the operations. So the analogy we use in the, in the guide that we wrote is to say, it's sort of like, imagine there's some Midwestern city in the United States that's just getting introduced to like Thai food, okay? And so in the beginning, there's only maybe a few people who are you know, from, from Thailand or something moving there and they start the restaurant and just a few adventurous people are trying it. And so in the beginning, there's only gonna be one restaurant in town that serves Thai food, right? And some naive observer might say, you know what, the Thai restaurant industry is clearly one exhibiting economies of scale. There's just one restaurant and that's it. And they might say, no matter how much the demand for this grows, 100 years from now, there's just, this restaurant is going to get bigger and bigger until it's serving millions of people a day, serving them lunch. And we realize, no, that's not what's going to happen. Yes, there is economies of scale for a small amount of customers or meals served. But after a while, another Thai restaurant would open down the street and then another and another as the demand in that community for that particular product grew. And so that's what we think is happening with, with Bitcoin mining that yes, there are economies of scale for a little while, a small range, but at some point, actually, you would expect other mining pools to operate. All right? So in other words, as an individual miner, it makes total sense for you to join a group of 99 other miners, but it doesn't necessarily mean that 100 miners would want to join a group of 10 million miners, that at some point that, that uh, logic wouldn't work. Okay, let me, I see some people, so let me stop right there and I'll, and I'll field your guys' questions for a few minutes. Hi, um, my name's Jez. Um, I was a professional miner. I had investments in uh, some big mining companies. Um, I'm so sorry, but your understanding of the mining business is completely wrong. Okay. I, I'm sorry. Well, let thanks, me... everybody. I'll see you next year. <laughs> um, the reality is that mining is dominated by some very large companies that own most of the mining equipment. And actually, the home miner is, you know, a tiny minority now of all miners. So your understanding is based on mining pools, which is 
technically correct, but the actual people doing the mining are not small home miners anymore because it's uneconomic to do that because the cost of mining is largely the cost of electricity now, and there are certain geo places in the world where electricity is cheap. So the professional mining is all happening in the, in the low-cost energy areas. Uh, like Washington State and Iceland, and huge companies uh, dominate mining now. Uh, and your understanding is is based on a year or two's mining world, not okay, today's okay, mining so world. Okay, the, so the the question was, how did I give such a fabulous talk? And then, thank you very much. No, no, no I, I love question, your talk, the, and, the and your logic was, is correct, you but say, your assumptions yeah, are wrong. Yeah, I, I'm partly repeating it for the video. Um, so the, he's saying that our the analogies I was giving there were are outdated and now there's it's the cost of elect, electricity is part of the issue and there's huge mining pools but but even there though are you are you predicting that 100 years from now why wouldn't there be several main players around those particular I think there's only three main players right now. Uh, and, maybe, maybe. And, and so 100 years from now, just three people are going to well, have access possibly to cheap less electricity? Now. Uh, no, I, I think there is a serious problem with mining. Okay. Uh, because the, the current cost of Bitcoin makes it um, marginal to mine. And so costs have been squeezed. And now only the very big players that do have economies of scale, they can, they're the only people that can currently mine uh, profitably. And even then, it's, it's very marginal for them at the current price of Bitcoin. Okay. Um, so I think there is a serious th- th- problem. Th- okay. And so this is, I'm not trying to evade it, but this is part of the issue of my co-authors. You know, afterwards, certainly I want to grab you. In my defense, I, we were clearly dealing with the, you know, we were quoting the objection, and the, we were dealing with the objection that was raised to Bitcoin. Okay, so this is slightly different. And yes, I don't, I don't want to just throw something off the, off the cuff here. And so, yes, I, I do want to grab you afterwards and, and see if we can refine that. Thanks. Okay, so I will go, go back to the fixed monetary uh, policy, like 21 million. So you seem to like it because it's predictable, but you know, cancer is also predictable and people don't really like it. Uh, so most people just get cancer when they get old. I'm sorry, what's predictable? And cancer. Cancer is equally predictable and risk-free. You are just going to get it, you know, sooner or later. So, um, you know, I, I don't think that Von Mises would like uh, the Bitcoin monetary policy because it lacks price elasticity, so it does not respond to the market at all. So, like, if the market wants more gold, a lot more gold will be extracted. If the market likes to buy Swiss francs, eventually the Swiss central bank decided to let them. Okay. So, um, uh, so, uh, so, uh, you know, what do you think about the lack of price elasticity in the Bitcoin monetary policy? Okay. So the question is, um, there, with something like gold, which clearly Ludwig von Mises was a, bit a fan of, if the demand to hold gold goes way up, the purchasing power of gold goes up, and that gives an incentive for miners to go dig more gold, okay? And so the price doesn't have to move as much, whereas with something like Bitcoin, if the absolute quantity is fixed, then the purchasing power would have to swing more based on changes in the population. Uh, that certainly is, is true, and I guess what I'm saying is that it's, we can predict those, those swings. So part of the issue is that there would be a big jump if the world embraced Bitcoin and you know it's it's sort of like a, a chicken and egg problem that as more people move to it they're doing it because they find it advantageous and so it's you know what I mean in other words we're saying Bitcoin obviously won't work because what if everyone thinks it's awesome and wants to use it and so you know there's there's that element. I wanted to thank you for the talk. Uh, I really appreciated it. I liked your anal- the way you described uh, deflation being not necessarily a bad thing. And I wanted to make a comment that I also think that the sign of a healthy economy is actually deflation. A healthy, productive, growing economy would be deflationary. And uh-huh. the fact that we see inflation everywhere is actually a sign that they're not healthy economies. But uh, my question is, how do you see the role of debt in a deflationary, healthy economy? Okay, so the question is, and then I think after these two questions, I got to stop. Uh, the question is, what happens with debt in a deflationary economy? And, and again, so that, uh, and it's a good question, and that is the, the concern among mainstream economists. Why is deflation so bad? It's when people have fixed denominated debt that doesn't itself adjust to changes in prices. Um, and I mean, one thing is people shouldn't become as indebted. That's one thing. But even there, again, what catches people off guard is when they didn't expect it. Okay, so if you're going to sign a 30 year mortgage, but you knew ahead of time that, gee, you know, let's let's say the world's all using Bitcoin. Right? So people in the year 2200, they still are going to borrow money from banks to take out mortgages to buy homes. And, you know, inst- you wouldn't agree and say, I'm going to pay you one Bitcoin a month on this mortgage payment for 30 years. 
if you had known your whole life that prices of things quoted in Bitcoin keep going down and salaries every year tend to go down by 8% quoted in Bitcoin. You would not agree to it. So again, the issue with people getting stuck with fixed value debts when prices go down is that they weren't expecting those huge collapses. So part of my question was just asked earlier, but I'll do a follow-up question. Okay. So you're right. The inflation in the Bitcoin space is very predictable, but the price of a Bitcoin is not. Right. So that's the real inflation deflation dynamic. So let's say in 20 years when there's really no new Bitcoin being created, um, how do you stop the world from screaming, we need a Bitcoin central bank to control the whatever fluctuation there is to adjust for a growing economy. Basically, how do you prevent the creation of a Bitcoin central bank after the fiat goes down and the world is on crypto? Okay, uh, so the question is, even after the thing loves off at 21 million, if the demand change where the prices could still fluctuate, wouldn't there be, how do you stop people from screaming? I can't stop people from screaming. They're going to scream. I'll guarantee you that right now. Whether we use Bitcoin. See? Security. All right. All um, right. But again, you could say that about anything. And so I think it's, you know, I know you're just playing devil's advocate, but it's sort of people are saying, you know, oh my gosh, there could be a central bank with this. So let's just rest content with our current central bank that we know is screwing us over. So uh, the virtue of Bitcoin is it's extremely decentralized. Yes, if Martians showed up and said, you better all swarm a central bank or we'll blow up Earth, maybe it would happen. But in terms of realistic scenarios, this is the best way to prevent a central authority from taking over the currency. Do we, do we have time for one more? Okay. I, you should um, include velocity in your model, uh, clearly. Uh, mm-hmm. That, uh, uh, you know, the assumption of monetarism is that velocity is constant. But we now know that velocity is anything but constant. That's monetary turnover, which would affect Bitcoin as much as any other currency. And will tend to give the power to the people who hold it. Mm-hmm. rather than to some central Bitcoin bank or whatever. Uh, Bitcoin, the people control the currency through velocity, through their speed with which they choose to spend or invest it. Okay, yeah, so great observation saying the, the purchasing power of money is not just the, quant- the number of money units, but it's also how fast does it turn over or what's the demand for the public to hold it? Look, if tomorrow everyone said, I don't like dollars, what would happen? The dollar price of things would shoot up, right? Because merchants would say, you got to give me a lot of dollars because I want to keep my goods, right? That's what happens in hyperinflationary economies. They don't want the currency and that's why prices for things shoot way up because nobody wants the money. And so there, it's, you know, same kind of phenomenon that at least with Bitcoin, my point is, one variable that we can lock down and control is the quantity of the actual currency. And yes, no matter what, in 2200, if people all of a sudden dump Bitcoin, Bitcoin prices are going to fluctuate. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin. Content for today's episode was provided by Austin, Robert, the Texas Bitcoin Conference, and Rob Mitchell over at the Bitcoin Game. These talks were clipped and mixed, but unedited. Music for today's show was provided by Jared Rubens and General Fuzz. Thanks for listening.